Well, hi, this is part two. My name is Michelle Steffler. Thank you for joining me. This is Historical American Art Pieces Explained. Now, last uh, segment, we did end with this slide. And I'm just going to remind you that this is beginning of the night, excuse me, the 1850s. And European style is really what's in style right now. It's really huge. Americans are buying up a European artwork for their early budding collections. We have an artist who is, was born in Massachusetts. His name is James Whistler. And he became fascinated with not only European art, but Japanese art. Um, Whistler was one of them among the first American artist working in England. So he was American, but he worked in England and he incorporated delicate oriental fabric patterns and props into his work. He is credited for spearheading what is called the Anglo-Japanese style in fine art. Uh, the Japanese inspired floral patterns and uh, woodcut designs were really, really gaining in popularity. Um, what you might not be able to see from the slideshow is that on the right, there's a portrait of James Whistler's mother. In fact, uh, this is not the name of it, but it's often called Whistler's mother. Uh, on the right here, what you will see is uh, the this curtain. And it has um, a floral pattern that's very Japanese inspired. So it's just kind of a well-known interest in Japanese aesthetic. Moving ahead to America in the 1860s, we're confronted with the Civil War. And I chose this piece, which is at the Eamon Carter Museum. And it is was created by a man named John Quincy Adams Ward, not to be confused with the original John Quincy Adams, right? But John Quincy Adams Ward uh, created this small scale uh, bronze piece uh, and it was a very powerful sculptural representation of the Emancipation was, and it was modeled upon the issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation by President Abraham Lincoln in 1863. Uh, and it clearly shows this very strong, willful, heroic, freed slave looking towards liberation. Uh, it's also engraved, might be hard to see, but it is engraved with a tribute to the 54th Massachusetts Volunteers the first, that was the first regiment of black troops in America who were massacred, uh, sadly, at Fort Wagner in South Carolina in 1863. The figure's right hand is um, in the manacle, which is like a handcuff, is a, a working version. And what that means is that there was also a tiny bronze key that would allow viewers uh, to symbolically release the slave. Winslow Homer, uh, Crossing the Pasture, painted in 1871 to 1872, and that is on the upper left. He was born in Boston, known for capturing the spirit and expressions um, of his subject matter. He painted scenes after his army life during the Civil War. After that, he painted scenes of youth, young women, young men, playfulness, peasant families, fishermen of Maine, and the nautical life by the sea. Kind of a classic example here of the budding, budding American realism. He painted in both watercolor, which we talked about earlier, easy to transport, easy for an artist to paint outside and in the field, but also back in his studio with oils. So here, it's the end of this figurative painting time. We're kind of moving in to a very influential landscape painting influenced by the English uh, artists. And this is kind of like the era, end of the era of romanticism in art, romanticism in art. Uh, here we have Thomas Moran. Okay, we have Thomas Moran in 1874. This uh, prolific artist was born in England in 1837, but in 1844, his family moved to Baltimore, Maryland, and later settled in Philadelphia. So although he was English born, he spent most of his um, life here in America. He began in his artistic training as an apprentice in a wood engraver shop. After two years, Moran left his in apprenticeship to begin a full-time painting career. 
Like many American artists of the time, Moran studied in Europe as a, as a young adult, focusing on the works of European masters briefly, particularly landscape artists like J.W. Turner and the National Gallery in London. Moran soon established himself as a painter, an engraver, and an illustrator, came back to America, painted a lot of, you know, really just vast landscapes, and um, sold his gigantic Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. So this is not it. This is called Cliffs of Green River, but there's a painting called the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone that um, was sold to Congress for the then unheard of price of $10,000. Um, Moran, who died in 1926 at the age of 89, was so prolific, as I mentioned, he produced more than 1,500 oil paintings, 800 watercolors, and hundreds of drawings and prints in his lifetime. Most of them depict the American West at a time when the completion of the Santa Fe Railroad enabled settlers to travel west as far as the California coast. Artists were drawn to the excitement and the freshness, the space, the exoticism of the native people's culture and landscapes of the Southwest. Um, on a side note, there is a um, artist in residence program that allows visual artists and performing artists to spend three weeks in the Grand Canyon on either the North or the South Rim. And they, that is named um, for Moran, Moran Point. Now, most people believe that it was named after this artist, but it could have also been named after his brother, Peter Moran, who was also an accomplished artist and explorer. Frederick Remington was not only a painter, but also a, um, he sculpted. He was born in upstate New York during the Civil War, and he was drawn to the West, as I keep saying, by like many of these artists, he enjoyed the great outdoors, the hunting, the fishing, the hiking. Remington's father would tell him stories of his time in the cavalry, exciting tales of adventure in the Wild West, but he expected Frederick to earn a college degree. So in 1878, he enrolled at Yale's School of Fine Arts, his father passed away a year and a half into his studies, and at that time, he went to Montana to try out a life on a ranch. He lasted only two months, can you believe it, just two months, before he left there and used his small inheritance to buy a sheep ranch in Kansas with his new bride. The Remingtons moved back to Brooklyn. Frederick briefly studied at New York's Art Students League, but they spent a great deal of time traveling to Arizona, Texas, New Mexico. The subject matter was the Western frontier, cowboys and the military. It was during the mid 1890s when Remington began to learn and quickly master the medium of sculpture. He, his initial attempts was to use the, what they were a lot of artists were using, which is called the sand cast method, which is very traditional at the time. But when he was introduced to something called the French lost wax process, all of his subsequent castings were done using that method. In a career that spanned less than 25 years, Remington produced more than 3,000 drawings and paintings, 22 bronze sculptures, wrote a novel, a Broadway play, and over 100 articles and stories. So he was a very busy man. Um, again, he just uses that um, kind of a cliche of the heroic, masculine, courageous figure who settled the West and their life and death struggles. John Singer Sargent was born in Florence, Italy to American parents therefore making him an American citizen. Sargent had a privileged childhood studying European art and culture, learning French, Italian, and German, in addition to English. He began his artistic training as a youth in Paris, and people loved his painterly brush stroke and brilliant use of color. Sargent's first success as a portrait painter came, not in England, but in America, on his two successive trips in 1887, 1888, 1888, and 1889, he traveled to New York in 1887 to paint the wife of a prominent banker and collector. He never married and traveled often exploring America and Europe. This allowed the artist swaths of uninterrupted quiet time to paint the landscapes and develop his style. Wouldn't that be nice to have swaths of uninterrupted quiet time? <laughs> 
Okay, so he was born in Europe, but traveled to America. Now we have an artist who was born in Pittsburgh. But she spent, she left as a late teen, early adult, and she spent most of her life in Paris. And this is Marie Cassette, Mary Cassette, 1890. She is an American female artist. Uh, she painted in the French impressionistic style, kind of heavy brushstroke, um, sort of a lot of colors, lighter in the foreground. Um, everyday scenes, and worked alongside fellow artists like Edgar Degas. Cassatt never married, but painted interior scenes of children and caregivers almost exclusively. So that was her subject matter. We have Charles M. Russell, who uh, M. and Carter did collect. This is titled Medicine Man. And Charles Russell was a self-taught uh, a Western American artist, storyteller, and sculptor who possessed a deep love for Montana and all of its wildness. His subject matter earned him the nickname the cowboy artist with his paintings and sculptures that personified the Wild West in the late 1800s. Born in Missouri in 1864, Russell began his life surrounded by voyagers, fur traders, outlaws, miners, loggers, and explorers with an urge to be a cowboy himself. He moved to Montana in 1880 to work a sheep ranch and ended up staying in Montana for the rest of his life. On the right, we have Child Hassam, who is known as America's foremost impressionist painters. Again, heavy brushstroke, lighter in the front, lots of color, um, sort of a, the idea that it was rushed or painted outside, very illuminated. Um, while studying in Boston, he was introduced to something that the French call plain air, P-L-E-I-N, plain air painting, which means that artists would actually paint outside using the light of the natural light of the sun to guide their, um, their artwork uh, as far as in the direction of the sunlight. And shadows. In 1898, Hassam and fellow Impressionists founded a small organization of American Impressionist painters who were interested in light, color, a painterly brushstroke, texture. But within a decade, most of them turned back towards inside and indoors to paint in their studios. All right. Well, we are shifting now towards modernism in, America, in Western art. Uh, the roots are in the 1860s, although many would say that it really didn't take hold or take grip until the 1880s. And so there is a shift from the anonymous artisan or the not as important artisan painting realistic scenes that dominated most of history before this time to, so we're, we're shifting from that to what's called the cult of the artist and the perception of personality and ego and personalized interpretations, appropriation and abstract, abstractions. Here in 1940s New York, this was the skyline, um, New York began to su supersede Paris as the center of the art world. Abstract expressionism emerges as the dominant new style. The Ashcan, which is A-S-H-C-A-N, Ashcan School was founded. It comprised a small number of painters who chronicled everyday life in New York City during the pre-war period, producing realistic and often uncomplimentary pictures or etchings of urban street scenes and genre scenes. So we went from a time where the emphasis was on really making people look good, look good so that they feel good so that they'll pay the artist, right? And so now we're moving towards chronicling everyday life, sort of the hardships um, of the American lifestyle. Here we have Ernie Barnes, who often painted life as an African-American in a somewhat segregated culture. Art, as he says, quote, art is about life and how you feel about it, unquote. It's not something that separates and up, up, us apart from life. You serve as a being, as kind of a reporter of your discoveries and your opinions. Barnes left college before graduating um, 
1960, he was selected in the 10th round of the NFL draft. Uh, he was an offensive lineman and he played five seasons of professional football for the New York Titans and San Diego Chargers and the Denver Broncos before concentrating on his artwork full time in Los Angeles. Barnes painted full time from the mid 1960s until 2008, exploring the physical strength of women beyond the context of sports. As you can see here on the right, the title is My Miss America 1970. It has a powerful and moving depiction of what it means to be both regal and muscular. If she has to carry the load, she can do so literally and metaphorically. Here we move into a completely different type of art made by Louis Comfort Tiffany. So Tiffany was a painter who became a leading designer of leaded glass windows in the United States from 1880s to the 1920s. Tiffany Studios created stained glass artwork for churches, public buildings in both the United States and Europe. Louis Comfort Tiffany revolutionized the production of stained glass and incorporated it into innovative designs and unusual decorative items. This served to reinvigorate an industry that had barely changed since the medieval period. He combined delicate craftsmanship with a love of color, and he became known for his ability to paint with glass. Although he is best known for his glasswork, he designed across a range of mediums, from jewelry to pottery, and was particularly associated with the Art Nouveau movement, featuring as one of its most imaginative and prolific creators. Tiffany's work grew on a ver very diverse range of influences, from the arts and crafts movement in England, which informed his craftsmanship, to historical and classical sources. He was particularly interested in the works of China, Japan, India, and the Islamic world and its Orientalist perspective, and it can be seen throughout his career. So I've mentioned that a few times, and I want you to start to understand that globalism is sort of happening right now because there is just a, a huge explosion of ideas and artists are being kind of sent throughout the world to study, but bring back and appropriate some of those same those same styles into their own artwork and into their own cultures. We're going to end here. This is going to be the completion of part two, and I hope you will join me for part three.